best pets. Illusions as carefully crafted as the brilliance of a gemstone. Myths that have reached deep into the popular imagination and fueled the fortune of one of the richest families on earth. Whilst the public is seduced by the rarity and romance of the stones, the Diamond Dynasty has been mining enormous quantities. Why do they sell for thousands of dollars per carat? Will they lose their luster as vast new deposits are uncovered around the world? An astonishing insight into the hidden facets of the Diamond Empire. Sunday at five past nine on BBC Two. In 15 minutes, BBC Two focuses on the circumstances of a man's death shot by police and his mother's fight to gain access to information about his killing. First, BBC Two casts its gaze over recent stories in the nation's press. This week, What the Papers Say is presented by John Sweeney of The Observer. Hello. You like nice, clean girl? You like my sister? I have naughty snaps. Actually, she's not my sister. She's Her Royal Highness the Duchess of York. Scandal of nude Fergie snaps. This in a week when Africa erupted and... NATO jets bomb Bosnian Serbs. About time, too. But Africa's misery in NATO's hot war against General Ratko Mladic and his mass murderers took second place to the home front. Sun worshipper Fergie in one of the mystery photos. Sun worshipper is what's known in the trade as irony, for the Duchess is unlikely to be worshipping the Sun newspaper after it has bared all. Censored! Well, nearly all. The mucky snaps led to a Sun sellout at my newsagents, which must cheer proprietor Rupert... Brisby! Murdoch. By the way, nowadays he's supposed to be a born-again Christian. He has a funny way of showing it. The sun's fading competitor, the Daily Mirror, limped in on Rupert's right royal soft porn show. Banned, thanks to your Daily Mirror. Nude Fergie photos, Fury. Horror videos. Horror videos? Fergie's not that bad, surely. Horror videos like Child's Play 3 are to be banned, thanks to the Daily Mirror. Yes, but what about Fergie? Tough new laws will be brought in later this year to stop monsters like Chucky, the Child's Play killer doll. And Budgie, the helicopter. Warping young minds. The warping of minds young and old stems from the muddy makeup of the Mirror's front page. The paper of... Honesty, quality, excellence. As it modestly observes on its front page, directed those interested in the Fergie snaps to page five. Storm of a Fergie nude snap. Yes, we've got that. By James Whittaker. Ah, yes, the man who doesn't make it up about the royals. A friend of the Duchess of York accused the Sun newspaper last night of blatant hypocrisy. As opposed, that is, to common or garden hypocrisy. After it published a nude photograph of Fergie on its front page. At the same time, it tried to tell its readers how sorry they were for her. Below the sensational picture, which had the word... Censored! ...stamped across her breasts, the Sun said it was returning the pictures to the Duchess. Powerful word, that. Censored. Censors are paid to have dirty minds, as someone said, but raising our sights above Fleet Street's navel for a moment, there are stories which never see the light of day because someone out there does not want them known. Nudie pics of the less complicated royal protoplasms are almost ten a penny in Fleet Street. Have you heard the one about the 11 gay Tory MPs? Mm, censored. What about the two cabinet ministers who are supposed to be an item? Censored. Back to the mucky pics, then. Nudes are in danger of replacing boring old news, and not just in the tabloids. An hourglass shape is more sensual than today's ideal. Thus the Times, which pinched one of the sun's page three girls and plonked her on a... Chaise long. That's French for a dodgy sofa. Supplied by Oula Boula. Crazy name, crazy shop. Antiques. To lend tone to the front of its tits and bums, uh, sorry, a review section, the mistake is easily made. Above the nudie pick, prize billing was given to... Edwina Curry on bestsellers with sex appeal. It's enough to make one celibate. The nudie pick sat above a pretty sensible piece by Mary Ann Seagard, rubbishing... The tyranny of thinness. Obeyed by today's models. In the nude, most of these women would look like a bag of knitting needles. They are virtually flat-chested. They have the narrow hips of an adolescent boy. And where they should be convex, they are concave. Though Seagard did include one vintage cliché. There was a brief moment in the late 1980s when breasts and bottoms came back into fashion. Leave it out, Gov. The ostensibly politically correct Guardian is not above the odd bit of raunchiness... Its front-page trundler borrowed not a page-free girl, 
But a page three caption writer to tell us about... Chesty Love, an exotic dancer who once filled page three of The Sun with her claims to possess... The biggest boobs in the world. The Guardian's Mr. Sleaze... Martin Walker in Washington. ...had news of an unusual American court case. The swollen breasts, which the court was told weigh ten pounds each, made her appear freakish and become a burden. Walker went on... Censored! That's enough of that smut. My own paper, The Observer, is not averse to the depiction of the female nude. Last week's censorship supplement ran a number of tasteful and, indeed, artistic images. Censored. 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 In no sense, peekaboo pictures thrown in to enliven the usual old rope. But while the bottom shelf papers ape the top shelf, it does not mean that they have deserted the moral high ground. Video nasties to be curbed for children. The Daily Telegraph, in common with most of Fleet Street, splashed on the latest government climb down. Powers backed by prison sentences to prevent children viewing violent videos were announced last night by Mr Michael Howard, the Home Secretary. It was a decision made in a moral panic, thanks to the Daily Mirror. At last, experts admit movie nasties do kill. Vidiots! The Sun. An X-rated video may have sown the seeds of murder in the mind of one of James Bulger's killers. Grizzly Chiller, Child's Play 3, was rented by John Venable's dad, Neil, days before James was snatched and battered to death. The other tabloids joined in on the act too. Anything the tabloids can agree on so vehemently must be suspect. Quite the finest piece of journalism on the Bulger killing was written by Gita Sereny in The Independent on Sunday. Neil Venables told me that although he saw the film, it was a neighbour who rented it and it had never been in his house. The police confirmed this point to Sereny. One detective told her they searched the Venables' home for pornographic and perverse films and found... Nothing. He said. And believe me, we were looking for it. But the films Neil had there were quite innocuous. Sereny goes on. I watched Charles Play 3 and did not think it was either so very terrible or had very clear parallels to the crime. Professor Ben Pimlet in The Guardian raised another concern. There is little evidence that violent fiction in history has ever been responsible for corrupting young people, despite frequent warnings from moralists. But violent fact is another matter. Pimlet is worried that... The commercialisation of fear is linked to a much wider exploitation, not of anxiety, but of prurience. Exploitation by, for example... ITV's tabloidised Carlton News, and by the almost equally dreadful London Tonight. Not only do such programmes, with their litany of deaths, rapes and beatings, degrade the audience, they degrade journalists. What Pimlet writes next also applies in spades to print. The most disagreeable and desensitising aspect is their style. A sort of lip-smacking, lugubrious, wallowing in misery, which the reporter or presenter lays claim to but does not feel. In the moral panic, it seems to have been forgotten that child killers predate video nasties. But our government has danced sharpish to the tabloid's tune. Who knows? Censored! May be the right thing for video nasties, but the righteousness of the tabloids makes one uneasy. And easy, too, must be the plutocrats who form the... Britain's richest 500. Seriously richer. Recession or no, it was not difficult to expand our survey of Britain's richest people to 500, introducing the country's most authoritative wealth guide, Ivan Fallon. Who he, Ed? Deputy editor finds old money giving way to children of the Thatcher years. Literally, in the case of the joint 303rd richest... Mark Thatcher, son of Lady Thatcher. Relation. As a Mr. Fixit in the Middle and Far East, he is reckoned to have made lucrative commissions on deals he helped secure. His fortune is difficult to pin down, as it's shrouded in Swiss secrecy, but £40 million is reckoned to be accurate. Thatcher intends to live in America, saying that as his mother is no longer in charge, Britain is... Going to the dogs. Bow wow. I could tell you the juiciest rumour about how Mummy's boy made his money, but that is... Censored! The Rich Gits Guide is an amusing read, but not entirely credible. The Independent reported a howler by the Sunday Times with the customary restraint Fleet Street sharks show for their wounded brethren. Richest of the rich table takes a pounding. Events moved quickly yesterday to show that estimating the wealth of the extremely wealthy is about as scientific as astrology. At number 188 came Sir Neville and Trevor Bowman Shaw, whose fortune had more than doubled from 30 million to 66 million pounds, we were assured. Oh dear. The survey said, We believe last year we seriously under valued Lancer Boss. Oh dear, oh dear. However, even as the Sunday Times was going to press, the forklift truck maker was preparing to call in the receivers. The Sunday Times has done better than this in previous years. In eighth place in the 1991 version came Robert Maxwell. It's that man again. Whose wealth had swelled from £1.1 billion to £1.2 billion. The guide noted, Maxwell seems to thrive on the pressure of his hectic deal-making and punishing schedule. When Maxwell made his big splash, it should be recalled, grief-stricken hacks gathered in the Daily Mirror pub and sang... We're, We're all going bob, bob, bobbing along. There's more. On the same ground rules, Azil Nadir was 36th richest in 1990 with a reported £213 million. He is now not letting the bastards grind him down in his North Cyprus hidey-hole. 
Ivan Fallon coughed up to a third howler. Five years ago, we also included another eccentric billionaire, the Nissan proprietor Octav Botnar. Crazy name, crazy guy. Now a fugitive in Switzerland. At the time, his lawyers fought a savage and, in the end, successful battle to persuade us to drop him from future lists on the grounds he had no money at all. The list was thus... Censored! ...by a rich fugitive who didn't want his name in lights. It is hard work exposing the rich to the glare of openness, but the Sunday Times on this form does not appear to have bothered over much. Another ex listee hit the papers on Thursday. Torres Nadia funds breach new code. Sir Norman Fowler, chairman of the Conservative Party... Worth nine bob to you, Gov. ...was challenged last night to give back the £440,000 his party received from the fugitive businessman Azil Nadia after he agreed to abide by a new code of conduct. The new code says in part... Illegally obtained money would not be acceptable and, if discovered to be so obtained, would be returned. So will Nadia's creditors get their money back from the Tories? No. The good news is that... The financial integrity of British public life... ...is such that no other action on party funding was necessary. This, the findings of a House of Commons report. So that's all right, then. The Guardian adds the following rider. Attempts to call witnesses to investigate devious practices... ...and the... ...sleaze factor... ...were blocked by the Conservative majority on the committee. They were, you've guessed it... ...censored! Not that all censorship is necessarily wrong... Fleet Street has entered into a conspiracy of silence over Scallywag. The magazine they tried to ban. And the magazine so dodgy it makes the sun seem reliable. Some of what is in Scallywag must be... Censored! ...for the very good reason that it is not true. What is readily checkable turns up to be false, which upsets one's faith in its more fantastic stories. Tory family values? Are they at it? This article is not intended as an exercise in... Outing? ...which we do not necessarily endorse. Nor is this about gay rights. It is about hypocrisy in the present government. We've done the hypocritical hypocrisy joke. Go on, go on. Several gay organisations and members of Parliament have alleged that these Tory MPs are homosexual but won't admit it. Scully Oag would have had a gay dozen were it not for a large black box. Who he, Ed? The magazine alludes to one of the great... Censored! ...rumours of our time that two cabinet ministers, whom we shall call... Mr X. ...and... Mr Y. ...have had a gay affair... The story contains one easily checkable fact. On Monday, January the 10th, the Today newspaper were due to print a story the following morning about a high-level police investigation into the origins of the... <laughs> ...letter. A fake referring to the affair circulating in the constituencies of the two MPs. At the last moment, before the presses were about to roll, the newspaper received a statement on behalf of... Mr. X. ...threatening a libel suit should the story be published. The article was immediately withdrawn. What the papers say phoned today, editor Richard Stott, to check Scallywag's story. Stott said it's not true. Not censored, just not true. Whatever the targets, journalists should not be able to damn someone's reputation without any evidence to back up the story. Scallywag is ignored because it breaks this proper rule. One turns with relief to the patrician ramblings of Peregrine Weston. The other day, the Daily Mail's gossip column carried an account of some inexcusably disobliging remarks made by my wife, Lucinda Lambton, about John Patton, the Secretary of State for Education. But Perry will surely not repeat the offending remark. She was quoted as saying... Oh, dear. In my greasy past, he is the biggest grease pot of all. Oh, dear, oh, dear. In fact, what she said was... He is a slimy skeleton in my cupboard. I lived with him 20 years ago. So is... Slimy skeleton in my cupboard. Tough talk for all time, Mr Nice Guy. It seems not. That the paper should not have bothered to get Lucy's phraseology right, however, is beside the point. The point is that she should not have been quoted at all. Perry was complaining that the Daily Mail hack breached his missus confidence. Two weeks later, he returned to his theme of broken confidence. That was the question I sought to raise in my column, and when a journalist from the Times rang me on the following Monday, I had hoped he was going to discuss it. Not at all. He wanted to remind me that some years ago I had betrayed a confidence of the Prince of Wales by printing something he had said at a private lunch. Therefore, was I not guilty of applying double standards? Uh, fair point. A fair point indeed. Last word to Private Eye, which monarchy on its uppers asks... Who will be President of Great Britain? Tip for the top is... Sir Peregrine Westall. 85. Though completely mad, Sir Peregrine is highly respected by the Sunday Telegraph and has a titled wife. His habit of deliberately... Censored! No, let the public know. His habit of deliberately breaking wind in public may, however, count against him. Good night. <laughs>